Hello, everybody. Let's start. Uh, I'm Peter, and I have a pleasure to introduce the next speaker for you. Uh, Qin Chen Wang is a PhD candidate at um, Amsterdam University. He has over six years industry experience in software development and data science. Uh, his greatest Kaggle success was solo winning uh, solo winning property inspection prediction competition three years ago. Today, he will tell us about his recent research considering data-driven uh, consumer debt collection. Please join me in welcoming Kaggle Grandmaster Chin Chen Wang. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. I hope you can hear me with this mic. Um, <clears throat> Just a quick show of hands. How many of you know what uh, reinforcement learning is? Okay, that's most of you. Now, how many of you know what a Markov decision process is? Okay, that's more than I expected. And how many of you know what the Bellman equation is? Okay, great. Um, so, for those of you who have experience in, uh, let's say, a non-business field, uh, there is uh, this field called operations research or operations management that has been dealing with uh, dynamic optimization problems for the past uh, 50 or 60 years. So while the Q learning uh, paper uh, came out in the late 80s, um, dynamic programming, uh, which is the other term for uh, basically reinforcement learning, uh, was used far earlier than that. <clears throat> um, and I am a PhD student uh, at the Amsterdam Business School, and um, my general uh, research topic is applying machine learning to uh, optimizing business processes. Now, business process could be anything. It could be some kind of a marketing problem. Uh, it could be some kind of a healthcare problem. But in this case specifically, it is a, a debt collection problem. So why do we do this? Well, because some company agreed to give us some data and to work with us on this. Uh, but the idea is very general, so you can think of this in your own, uh, your own business problems if you have them. Um, so this is different from the, the past few uh, presentations where uh, we want to go beyond prediction. Okay, so it's great to be able to do prediction. We do that uh, basically for living on Kaggle. Uh, but in practice, uh, at least in my own research field, and also a lot of the times in, uh, in the industry, the question is, what can you do with predictions? So here, we're going to uh, do it for uh, debt collection. <clears throat> and please uh, raise your hand if you have any questions, comments. There's plenty of time. So uh, this presentation today is uh, actually a research project that I've been working on for the past uh, a bit over a year. Um, but the actual amount of time we spent working on it may have been one or two months, except going through the whole process with our industry collaborator is what takes a ton of time. So uh, just the end of April is when we uh, completed our um, uh, controlled field experiment, basically to validate how good our approach was. Uh, so you can imagine what well, we started in uh, January of last year, and uh, it took us quite a bit of time to go through the process. <clears throat> um, and part of this project is uh, mostly myself and uh, my PhD colleague, uh, Ruben van der Heer, from uh, the Free University in Amsterdam, and also uh, his uh, uh, advisor, uh, Professor Sanjay Bulai, also from the Free University. So a bit of uh, background on the general problem. Uh, well, it turns out that uh, there's a lot of people who owe money, and uh, this is specifically in the Netherlands, but uh, apparently in 2014, almost 18% of uh, households had overdue debt. So it's not that you owe money, it's that you owe money uh, and you agree to pay, but you never actually paid. <clears throat> and for companies that require uh, installment payments, so think of uh, insurance companies, telephone companies, uh, where you don't pay uh, for the service up front, you pay in installments monthly, maybe uh, you know, semi-annual, um, it's important for them to be able to collect the money, uh, well, basically as early as possible so that they can remain in business. 
And uh, back in 1986, uh, there was this book on debt collection, and uh, this guy said, well, it would be great if you can think of all of the cases where people owe money, and you can already classify them to uh, ones that are easy to collect from and ones that are hard. And of course, now with uh, machine learning, AI, big data, we can actually do this. <clears throat> so I'll show you uh, for the rest of this presentation how we do it. And I will also show you the uh, experimental results that we got from it. So, how debt collection works. Uh, we actually learned a lot about debt collection through this project. Uh, and also through this project, I was personally <laughs> collected from. Uh, it was quite interesting. <clears throat> so that, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so, so how this process works is that uh, let's say uh, you owed money to a company, uh, maybe a, a telephone company. You didn't pay your monthly bill. Uh, and um, they don't really do anything to you until about uh, 8 to 26 weeks afterwards. So 8 weeks is 2 months, 26 is half a year, right? So uh, 2 months after you don't pay, uh, they decide to uh, put your case uh, to a debt collection agency. Now there are two different kinds. Uh, one kind of agency, they actually purchase the debt and then whatever they collect is their own. The other kind, uh, they collect in the... Uh, uh, they collect for their client, where uh, the client gets the principal amount uh, and the agency gets a little bit on top of that. And both are uh, both happen and they're both okay. But the idea is that uh, if you're in collections, uh, that means you haven't paid in a long time. It's not that if you forgot to pay uh, the next month, you're going to be harassed. <clears throat> and the collection agency, they can use basically three different tools. They can send you letters, uh, they can send you emails, and then they can make phone calls. Uh, of course, letters and emails are cheap. It's all automated, but phone calls, uh, they actually have to have humans make the calls. So it's quite expensive. And the purpose of this uh, project uh, and this presentation is to optimize uh, the phone call so that uh, as the collection agency, you're getting the most uh, out of uh, the efforts that you make. And uh, in the end, if the debtor still refuses to pay, then the, the agency has the power to uh, basically take you to court. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, it's quite expensive to take someone to court, so it's actually very bad for the agency to do it, and it's also very bad if you're forced to go to court. Uh, but nevertheless, the agency has to do that as well as a threat so that you don't just not pay. And uh, the goal of our project is to uh, basically maximize the amount of collection before uh, people go into uh, this so-called legal phase. Because once you go into the legal phase, uh, and the process belongs to uh, this other body. <clears throat> so here's an example timeline of how debt collection works. So day zero is when a case uh, is sent to the agency. So of course, this is maybe half a year after you haven't paid your debt. Uh, in my case, I went to the doctor, and then I actually uh, uh, received the bill, but in between, I moved to a new address, so <laughs> the bill was at my old address, and I never got it, and eventually, I got this letter from the uh, debt collection agency that says, oh, you owe money, uh, you owe this amount, and you have to pay us this amount, um, and uh, what are you going to do? So, uh, here's the actual process. Uh, day zero, when the case arrives, um, about uh, one day later, the agency will send a letter to uh, uh, the debtor. Uh, the agency will also send an email at the same time. This is all automated. Uh, and then about one or two days after that, uh, they will uh, make a phone call to you. Uh, so the letter will say something like, oh, uh, you haven't uh, paid this money that you owe to our client. Uh, please pay this amount uh, to this bank account. Uh, and you can contact us at this email or, uh, or this phone number if you wish. <clears throat> and then the, the, the email, the letter, they all say the same thing. Um, and then the phone calls are basically made by humans and therefore the conversation can go in any way, uh, can go organically. Um, but with the letter that was sent, they also say, please pay us before uh, a certain date. Usually that's about one week after uh, the letter was sent. So uh, if you don't pay, then uh, usually uh, by around, let's say, day 9 or day 10, uh, the agency will send you another letter. It will say, oh, okay, you still haven't paid this. We would really appreciate it if you pay uh, this uh, amount uh, within you know, the next 7 or 8 days. 
uh, again, they can make phone calls to you during this process. And uh, if you still don't pay by about day uh, 18, 20, they'll send you a third letter. Now this time it's a bit serious. They say, okay, you haven't paid. You know, if you don't pay us, uh, we can consider taking legal action. So personally, that's when I paid uh, because I knew the process. So actually, usually there's four letters. So by the third letter, you really have to pay. If you don't pay, again, after about a week, maybe 10 days, uh, they'll send you a fourth letter and say, okay, now this is getting serious. We're putting you into uh, the, the legal action bin and uh, anything can happen, something like that. <clears throat> so that, that's the general process. And basically, you know, each letter uh, uh, communicates with increasing urgency the need to pay. Um, and phone calls can be made at any time. Uh, usually they're made to uh, negotiate payment plans or to defer payments. So you know, if you owe money and uh, you maybe are not able to pay at the time, they're willing to say, okay, you can pay us um, in the next month. Uh, they'll schedule a date where you have to make the payment before. Uh, or they can say, okay, you owe 100 euros, but we'll let you pay 25 euros every month for the next four months. So you can negotiate basically anything with the collection agency as long as they're fairly confident that you will eventually pay all the money. So now we have the problem for the debt collector. Um, given that uh, there are many, many cases to collect from, so in the case of this, um, in the case of this uh, agency that we work with, they have a total of about 250,000 cases per year. Right? So when you have a lot of cases to collect from, of course that's not all for the same client, uh, but the question is, uh, given limited calling capacity, maybe at a given time you have six people making phone calls, so who should you call uh, in order to maximize the return on the calling effort, basically to maximize the long-term revenue for the collection agency? <clears throat> Uh, if you call someone who was going to pay anyway, then you wasted your effort, right? You didn't have to call the person, they would have paid. I made the payment, they never called me. <laughs> I didn't want to go to court. Um, but uh, there are people who are thinking whether they should pay or not. Maybe they don't know if you're serious uh, about this. Uh, and those are people you may have to pay, uh, you may have to call, uh, because if you don't call them, then maybe they don't pay. And again, it's bad for them to go to court, but it's also bad for you debt collection agency. Uh, furthermore, there are actually a group of people who uh, are just not contactable. They ran away, basically, left the country. And those are the people that uh, you should stop calling once you have a good uh, feel that that is the case. So what does our paper do? Well, uh, we present a framework, uh, and this follows the traditional Markov decision process framework, uh, which allows for the data-driven optimization of scheduling outbound calls made by debt collectors. And uh, I'll explain more about that later. Uh, well, we formulate it as a Markov decision process. However, because the Markov decision process here is intractable uh, due to the extremely large state space, um, we use a uh, light GBM to do what's called a value function approximation. Basically, for every uh, state, we make an approximation of the value of that state using uh, GBM. And we're able to identify insights that can be linked to a more efficient collection process. So in, uh, in business research and academia, people care about managerial insights. It's not sufficient to just provide a black box algorithm to do something. Uh, it's also important to show, to, to be able to uh, reasonably say why your black, your black box algorithm is telling you to do this. And we're able to do that even though we use like GBM uh, we could still construct uh, a posteriori um, when our algorithm thinks that it's nice to call someone. And then we actually validate uh, this in a controlled field experiment. Um, usually, whether it's in you know, real life projects, proof of concepts, or even in research, um, people do some uh, experiments with some existing data, but they don't actually implement this in practice and to test it. So this, for us, is kind of like the most important uh, cherry on the cake. And I'll tell you the uh, experimental results at the end. So, well, our paper is not really about debt collection. We don't really care about debt collection. Um, what we care about is actually this process here. Uh, so 
um, we have domain knowledge, we have some data, right? Which is, uh, we, we know what the debt collection agency does, and uh, we have uh, data on their historical transactions uh, and the logs of their interactions. And we frame this as a supervised learning problem. I'll explain that later. Uh, with the supervised learning predictions, we can then turn it into an optimization problem, which then we use, uh, in this case, a Markov decision process framework to actually optimize the actions. Uh, and then we deploy this uh, with the debt collection agency, and we're able to evaluate it in a controlled field experiment. So it's the, it's the process that's really important for us. Um, and uh, the so-called contribution to academic literature here is really uh, this second arrow here, or maybe the first one, but mostly the second arrow here with supervised learning problem. Because in the, the field of operations research, people uh, either just use uh, means or averages or maybe a very simple linear function um, for uh, leading up to their optimization problem. Uh, we actually uh, frame this as a proper supervised learning problem. So data description, uh, we, ha we got uh, data with, from this uh, Dutch collection agency. They handle about 250,000 cases each year with principal of 120 million euros. And in the particular uh, uh, case, uh, or not case, but client uh, of theirs that we're dealing with here, uh, we got a data set of about 80,000 debtors, uh, and uh, they arrived between the 1st of January 2014 to September 30th, 2016, and all these debtors were customers of the same insurance company. <clears throat> and the insurance could be car insurance, it could be uh, motorbike insurance, I'm not sure of the details, but there's a, a large number of them, uh, maybe 10 to 20 different uh, possibilities. And the current calling policy of the agency is static. Uh, basically, uh, every day they just put uh, all of the cases uh, where they can call somebody into this pile and then the uh, collectors just decide uh, manually who they want to call. So not very intelligent. Um, and then the data set that we got uh, contains, uh, basically it comes from four different sources. We have some information about the debtor. Uh, for example, the type of insurance that the product was uh, and the date uh, the debtor, uh, the case arrived the postal code uh, where the debtor lives, and the original uh, debt amount. It turns out that postal code and date of arrival et cetera, are not very important, so we basically don't use anything about the debtors themselves, just about uh, the debt itself. <clears throat> we also have a log of the communication uh, between the, the agency and the debtor. So it, they're not in detail, but they say things like, okay, uh, on this day, a letter was sent to this debtor. Uh, on this day, a phone call was made to the debtor and nobody picked up, or uh, there was a conversation, but they don't actually specify what happened. Uh, we also have a log of incoming payments, so we do know when the debtor uh, had paid all their money. Uh, and we also have this log of status and substatus changes, which was uh, created by the agency. So, for example, if you, were, uh, if you just had received the first letter, uh, then the status of your case was something like first reminder. If you had made a promise to repay your debt, uh, then the st status is something like made a promise. Uh, or if you made a promise and it's past the date for which you promised to pay, then they'll say, okay, broken promise. Uh, but this is uh, basically a, a log of, uh, uh, of statuses that uh, the collector uh, keeps. So a bit more uh, information. Uh, in the left is a histogram of the uh, size of the debt uh, in euros. So you can see that most of the debt are about uh, 100 to 200 euros in size, uh, but there are a few that are over 1,000, so we uh, cap this uh, at 500 euros here. And uh, the second graph on the right here is, uh, is the probability distribution of payments uh, with respect to the number of days it's been since the case arrived. So as you can see, most of the payments happen, or the mode at least, happen around nine days after uh, arrival. And that's basically because nine days is the deadline of the first letter, right? So you receive a letter and then they say, okay, you have to pay us by this day. And that's usually nine days after uh, the case has arrived. And you can see these uh, peaks here because every peak is either the 
uh, end uh, or the, the, the deadline of the previous letter or the arrival of the next letter. So sometimes people will pay the debt right after they see the letter. Sometimes they'll wait until oh, they absolutely uh, have to pay in order to do it. So you see these peaks. It's just to show that the data is uh, fairly well behaved. Um, and here in the left graph, we see uh, uh, in the data the amount of phone calls uh, that were made uh, with respect to the day since arrival. And as you can see, most of the phone calls are made uh, within the first week of arrival. Uh, they'll call you and say, oh, okay, you owe money. Uh, have you received this uh, letter that we send you? And if you have any questions, we can discuss, but please pay us. Uh, and of course, again, there are peaks because after the second letter, after the third letter, usually the agency will try to call uh, the debtor. Uh, and then the, the second graph on the right is amount of payments that were made uh, with respect to each day of month. And this is just to basically show that towards the end of the month, there are more payments being made because in the Netherlands, people receive paychecks once a month and it's usually the last uh, week of the month. So when they get their payment uh, or their paycheck, they're more likely to make the payment. Uh, we don't actually use this in our model, but uh, it could be interesting if there were extensions to be made. So yeah, what is a Markov decision process? Well, it's, uh, it's a mathematical framework for modeling decision-making in situations where outcomes are partly random and partly under the control of a decision-maker, according to Wikipedia. Uh, so here's a very uh, small toy example uh, in our case. So let x sub i be uh, something like a vector uh, for, to represent the state of a debtor. And the vector contains the number of phone calls that have been made so far to the debtor, uh, the amount of money uh, that uh, they still have to pay, and the number of days it's been since the case has arrived. Uh, so in this case, uh, to the right here, on day zero, the state of a debtor is uh, 0, 101, uh, because a zero means there has been zero phone calls made so far. Uh, debt outstanding is $100, uh, and it's been zero days since arrival, because this is the day of arrival. And uh, there was no action taken. Uh, on day one, um, the state is 0, 101. So again, zero phone calls made, because in the previous day, there was no action. Uh, $100 uh, is still the amount owed, uh, but now it's been one day since arrival. And again, no action was taken. And now on day two, um, one phone call has been made. Uh, actually, this is a, this is a mistake. Uh, this should still be zero, and the next one should be one, but assume that one phone call was made between days one and two. Um, uh, the amount outstanding is still $100. The person did not pay his debt. Um, and also, it's been two days since uh, arrival. And then on day three, uh, it turns out that uh, between day two and day three, uh, the person paid all of his debt. So outstanding now becomes zero. Uh, again, the number of phone calls made so far is one from uh, between day one and two. And also, it's been three days since the uh, arrival of the case. Uh, so this is the uh, state space framework that we are working with. And the goal is to say uh, for, let's say, um, uh, 10,000 outstanding debtors, um, who is the best people to call? Which is to say, uh, if you uh, make a phone call between day one and day two here, so you have two different states, there's a change, right? For, for each state, what is the current uh, value of the state, and value means uh, is something, in this case, it's monetary, how much money, uh, marginal money you can collect. I'll explain that in a bit. Um, and then basically, the effect of making a phone call now becomes the difference in value between two states that you go into. So this is the exact state definition that we have, uh, which is quite large. Uh, for example, we have day of week, week of month, uh, days uh, since last contact, days since last phone call, days since last incoming contact, uh, whether the person has repaid partially, uh, whether a repayment plan is in place, whether the phone number is known, etc. So we have 20-some um, uh, 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 features here, and you can imagine that if you were to model this uh, in a standard uh, Markov decision process, then your state space would be something like x to the power of 20-something, 
And that's uh, far too large, it's not tractable. So what we do instead is to uh, use a gradient boosted tree to approximate all of the state space into one single value, which we call well, the probability uh, of PRP, so predicted repayment probability. And with that, you're able to do uh, optimization. <coughs> So here's an example of uh, how we do this. Um, imagine you have uh, three cases. The first one is debtor A after T days, uh, and your X, uh, so your features are uh, four phone calls made up to time T and $100 uh, outstanding. And this person with an outcome of one means that this person eventually repaid all of the debt uh, well, before going to legal action. So we remove all of the cases that would, uh, uh, that repaid after legal action. So then we have a second case where the, the debtor B, uh, after T days, uh, three phone calls were made until uh, day, T, uh, day T, and also $150 are outstanding, and this person eventually did not pay. And the question for debtor C is, well, well, based on what we know about debtor A and B, what can we predict for debtor C, right? And, and if we predict that based on this current uh, setup of three uh, phone calls made until T and uh, $125 outstanding, uh, let's say we predict repayment probability to be 60%. Now we also compare if the person, uh, if we made one extra phone call. So if on today we decided to make a phone call to the person, which means that the number of phone calls made until T becomes four, uh, then what is the uh, predicted outcome? If we predict the outcome to, let's say, be 65%, then the marginal effect of making that phone call is a 5% increase in the probability of repayment. And of course, in terms of revenue, that's 5% increase multiplied by the amount of debt that the person owes. And that directly is computed as a, a monetary value. <clears throat> and we do all of this through a gradient boosted uh, trees, so light GBM. So other uses of value function approximation. Uh, AlphaGo does this exactly. Uh, what they do is um, basically formulating the, the Go board uh, as like an image and then uh, use, uh, I believe, convolutional neural networks to approximate the value of a specific board position. Uh, and with that, they're able to decide what is the best action to take from a given uh, board position. Before uh, neural networks, they did this they didn't use value function approximation, and that's why it wasn't able to beat the best humans. Uh, not on the full board, they did it, I think, on like the 13 by 13 or nine by nine board. But when the state space got too large, they couldn't do it, but thanks to uh, deep learning, it worked very well. And of course, uh, you see all these uh, media uh, videos on uh, Boston Dynamics. I mean, they, robotics is also using some form of function approximation because they can't uh, model all of uh, physics, uh, so instead they have to use some kinds of functions. Um, it could be a linear function, but I don't actually know what they do. Uh, there's also this idea of inverted helicopter flight. If you took uh, Andrew Ng's course, I think he shows this uh, every year. I think that was his uh, PhD thesis. So, um, yeah, so for model training, we split uh, the, the data into basically a train validation. We split by time to avoid any kind of leakage. Uh, for the training set, we start, uh, we take 2014 and basically half of 2015. And then for validation, we take the second half of 2015 and uh, the two thirds of 2016. It's very standard. Uh, and then for each debtor, we label them as having fully repaid if they paid all of their debt before the stage of legal action. And in the training sample, uh, I think well, the training and validation sample combined, this was 76.1%. It turns out in our uh, uh, experiment, uh, this has become a lot lower, and that's basically because the collection agency is making their own life difficult. They, they collected all the easy cases, and now what's being given to them are the harder cases, unfortunately. Uh, so they're basically eating up their own business and what we do is we train one uh, light GBM model for each day since arrival. Uh, so we basically trained uh, 50 different models uh, using the, basically the, 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 same, uh, the same features, kind of like uh, the previous uh, presentation. 
Um, we could have put this all into one single model, but it turns out that it's uh, the, the computations for the marginal, uh, marginal effect of phone calls seem to be a lot more stable with 50 different models instead. And here's uh, some performance metric. So <clears throat> in the x-axis is the number of days since arrival. Since we trained 50 models, we have basically uh, uh, 50 different uh, predictions, one for uh, each, uh, well, for each case and each uh, day since arrival combination, we make one prediction. Um, and basically, take uh, here, for example, at uh, day 30. So for all of the cases that were 30 days into the process, uh, with our uh, light GBM uh, model, we are able to get something like a 0.64 AUC. Uh, comparatively, using a logistic regression, so just standard logistic regression, that's the AUC is about 0.6. And also, if you take uh, light GBM without the historical interaction information, you get also about 0.6 AUC. So, uh, as somebody who does uh, predictive analytics, this looks really low. Right. But what does this mean? It could mean that our model is really bad, but it could also mean that it's just a very difficult problem. So we don't really know. It, it, it could be good, it could be bad, and therefore we have to actually implement this and test this to see if it actually uh, makes sense. And actually, it, it turns out that uh, uh, if you smartly create a logistic regression model, you can approach the performance of uh, light GBM. And that's also the case in most Kaggle competitions, but it's a lot of work, right? And it's easier to just throw everything into a tree and uh, get profit. <laughs> so here are two graphs of two actual uh, debtors that uh, we label the, the, the actual interactions and also our predictive repayment probability. And it's just to show that uh, our model seems quite reasonable. So in the first case, uh, the person started with a predicted 80% uh, repayment, and uh, well, there was a letter, there was a phone call, and then about a week later, there was another letter and a phone call. In the ca first case, the phone call had no answer. The second case, uh, somebody answered the phone. Um, and then about two weeks later, uh, nothing, no, we, the person did not pay. Uh, and there was a third letter, and then a third phone call, and no answer. Um, and as you can see, the predicted repayment probability kept on decreasing. So it turned out that uh, this person actually ran away. Uh, the phone call was made and answered by somebody who says, this person does not live in this address anymore, uh, and therefore the repayment never happened. And by about day 36, uh, I think the collection agency decided to just uh, throw away the, the case or went into legal action. I'm not sure what happened afterwards. Uh, in the second uh, graph here, uh, the person started with a much lower repayment probability, and of course, again, a uh, letter and email was made, uh, but notice that there were no phone calls made. So it turned out that I think in this case, uh, the agency didn't have the phone number of the debtor, and that's part of the reason why the predicted repayment was lower. Uh, but after the second letter and email was uh, sent, uh, there was a phone call made, and I think that's because uh, the, the agency is continuously looking for phone numbers that could be matched to this person. So they're actually actively trying to find a phone number to call. Uh, but nobody answered. Uh, fortunately, a few days later, they make another phone call. Uh, it was answered. Uh, and then on the same day, uh, the debtor actually called in. So usually when the debtor calls in to the agency, it's a very, it's a positive because it kind of means that, okay, the debtor acknowledges that he owes the money and they just need to work out some way for the repayment to happen. And that's also why the predicted repayment probability, probability uh, jumped from 0.6 to 0.8. That's a very significant uh, change. Uh, and then more things kept happening, uh, and eventually this person did pay on day 35. <clears throat> so this is just to map out uh, what our model predictions are showing on a daily basis. So with our model, uh, we can then quantify the value of a debtor being in a particular state, which is to say we predict that this person will eventually pay his or her debt with a probability of X, and that is the quantification in this case. And then we can compute the changes if we make an extra phone call. And uh, the marginal value of a phone call depends uh, on the state, so 
for example, did this person pick up the phone before? Uh, how many days has it been since the last outgoing call? Uh, did this person promise to pay? And what uh, insurance product type uh, did the person have? So these are all information that goes into predicting the, uh, the marginal value of making a phone call. And of course, you just have to uh, sort all the cases and call the debtors who have the highest marginal value per phone call. So I think this is all very straightforward. And here we have a controlled field experiment. Um, so part of getting to this process uh, or getting to this stage uh, was having back and forth with the collection agency to make sure that they understand what our model is doing and what our proposed results are. So a key part is that um, we have to have managerial insights that also fit with their own business understanding. And it turns out that in this case, it did fit very well. And I'll tell you what, uh, what those insights are in, the, in a later slide. Uh, so we performed this control field experiment where we randomly assigned 921 debtors that arrived between January, uh, uh, and January 19th and February 28th of this year. Um, they were basically flip a coin and either assigned to the current uh, static policy that uh, the agency had or this uh, data-driven policy that we made. <clears throat> And then the debtors were followed until the 30th of April so that uh, each debtor had at least 60 days uh, of time uh, to see what would happen. And uh, here I have the results. Uh, in the red is the incumbent uh, static policy and in the green is our data-driven policy. So first, uh, we see that there was a 3.6% uh, increase in the uh, number of fully collected cases. Um, so in the, the red case, in the incumbent uh, policy, uh, there were 275 cases uh, fully collected out of 466. And in the data-driven policy, there were 285 cases collected out of 455. So it's a 3.6% increase. And also for the people who did repay fully, uh, they paid almost two days earlier. Now this is nice because, uh, well, the earlier you get your money, the happier you are. So the agency is very happy about that, and, and I'm sure so are their clients. Now, this isn't statistically significant, but uh, uh, our sample was fairly small at only 921 debtors. <clears throat> there was also a 14% increase in the average recovery rate, and the average recovery rate is defined by the amount of uh, money that was collected divided by the total amount of money that was owed. So in the static policy, they ended up collecting 57% of the amount owed. And in the data-driven case, they collected 65% of the amount owed. And ultimately, 21% um, fewer uh, calls were made. So in the uh, incumbent policy, they made 1,355 outbound phone calls. And in the data-driven policy, they only made 1,064 phone calls. <clears throat> And of course, well, when you compute the amount uh, collected per call, that was a huge increase. Um, so if you were to extrapolate these results to the whole agency, so of course this is just uh, one uh, short period within one of their clients, but if you extrapolate that, uh, then a short uh, back of the envelope calculation would come to about a, a few million uh, euros in cost savings per year and also a few million in increased uh, amount collected, or I think revenue for the agency per year. So we're also able to gather some managerial insights. And we make fewer phone calls, but the question is why, right? I mean, why, why are fewer phone calls made, and how, how did that uh, become like that? <clears throat> uh, so first, we know that, OK, this data-driven policy is uh, a lot better. Uh, but how do they differ? So it turns out that uh, in the data-driven approach, it's assigning more resources to the more difficult debtors. So it's basically saying, okay, these people are very likely to pay even if you don't call them, so don't call them. There's this other group of people, and it turns out that they're usually later in the process um, where a phone call could matter a lot more. And intuitively, you can think of it as uh, well, you owe money, but you don't really want to pay the person, and you just hope it goes away. Uh, and at that point, if you receive a phone call from the agency, they try to persuade you to pay, and you think, okay, fine, I should pay this debt. 
Uh, that seems to be what's happening. And also, <clears throat> uh, the data-driven policy is saying you should not uh, call people too recently. And what does that mean? So if you, just yesterday uh, the, the agency called you, uh, then it's bad for them to call you again today because you already know that you owe the money. Um, so even if they call you and harass you, I don't think that will change uh, whether or not you want to pay. However, uh, in some cases, it's been uh, maybe somebody uh, contacted you uh, last week, and now again, you're in this stage of hoping that it will just go away, and then you know, one week later, they call you again, and they, they say nicely that you should pay. Maybe you're more willing to pay. Uh, and also, it's important to follow up with debtors who have actually contacted the collector themselves, because that means they've already uh, acknowledged that, okay, there's this outstanding case. Whether I believe I owe the money or not, uh, at least I acknowledge it. Whereas if I never pick up the phone, if I never contact the debtor, then uh, they don't really know if I ran away or if, uh, or if I just should be called. <clears throat> so, so these are the, uh, the insights that we derive. And, and how do we do this? Well, um, we take the validation data set, and of course we've made predictions on the, uh, on the repayment probabilities, and we made predictions on the repayment probability if um, the number of phone calls was increased by one. And then of course we sort them by uh, the expected marginal return. And then all we have to do is compare basically the top half of the group with the bottom half of the group. And it turns out that uh, the calls where the marginal uh, return was uh, predicted to be high uh, are to debtors who have been in the collections process longer, who have not been called recently, have picked up the phone previously, uh, and also have contacted the, the collector themselves in the past. So that turns out to be quite, uh, uh, quite clear once you look at it and make graphs. I don't have them uh, here at the moment. Uh, but I, I would say that they're pretty much analogous to these uh, coefficients that you get from something like a linear regression model. It's just that uh, instead of getting it for free, you have to go back and uh, manually uh, construct it. Yeah, so in conclusion, uh, we use machine learning to approximate a very high dimensional decision problem. Uh, we provide the business with the easy to understand tool, so it's just a Python script that uh, reads in some CSV files and makes predictions and outputs another CSV files. Uh, this is done once a day, um, and then uh, the collection agency simply has to uh, sort it by and then uh, take uh, the top X percent based on their capacity for any given day. Uh, and we validated this with a controlled field experiment, and uh, this paper will be uh, submitted to uh, this uh, informed management science journal soon, once we've finished writing it. So that's all I have. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Yes. So I, I have the first question, sorry. <laughs> because, um, in reinforcement learning, uh, you allow uh, the agent to be somehow random. You allow, uh, like, uh, specifically some random moves in uh, AlphaGo, for example. Um, and I'm wondering if the data that is coming from this uh, static policy is random enough and it explores yeah. the state uh, so you can predict uh, at every stage what. Uh, that's right. So that's a very good question. Uh, so we do, so a step back. If you use Markov decision processes, uh, you are already assuming that uh, your data is uh, unbiased. Uh, and as a result, you don't do exploration. Whereas if you're doing, I guess, more typical reinforcement learning, you have to do some kind of exploration. And uh, in our case, because exploring would be very difficult, we uh, simply use the data that's available, and that's what you're asking. I'm trying to get back to the, to the slide with the, the picture. Uh, but okay, so here we have uh, outbound phone calls, right? And as you can see, uh, they are, of course, not completely random. More, more phone calls are made only a few days into the process. Uh, but indeed, it's not like there are some days with zero phone calls. So we do have quite a bit of randomness, and that's the result of uh, lack of capacity by the agency. So some days they can make a lot of phone calls, uh, some days they can't. Uh, so it's not perfect. I agree it's better to actually do some kind of uh, um, 
random exploration, but in this case, um, well, we got nice results, I would say, and, and that's, I wouldn't say it, it validates our model, but uh, it, it adds a bit more evidence to support it. Uh, so it was a good question, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I have two questions. Yep. Uh, the first one is uh, your predicted value is like, will um, will the debt be paid before legal action is taken? No, be yes, that's right, before legal action is taken, okay. yes. Okay, my question is why didn't you take, uh, will the debt be paid before next call? Because now you have uh, many inputs like if someone pays after the fifth call, yeah. then like you have one, one, then two, one, then three, one, yeah. then four, one. I think it, like, like why is it normal, accurate yeah. to have one, zero, two, zero, right. so, so four, one? So this is actually the most important part of the, the trick to our uh, value function approximation. Uh, the, because it's a dynamic optimization problem, we care about the, uh, the long run return, right? So we don't care if, uh, you pay the debt after the fifth call. Uh, what we care is you eventually pay the debt before, let's say, the end of the horizon. And if we model the problem as what is the probability of repayment before, let's say, the next call, uh, then we also have to uh, specifically model what's going to happen after the fifth call or the next call, right? And if we try to do that, um, our state space, again, will just grow exponentially large. Uh, my second question, when you predict the value, how do you move to a Markov problem? Because I don't, and you, you talked about a Markov decision problem. That's right. I don't see where it is once you. That's you, right. Is so so the, the original formulation is a Markov decision problem, okay. right? Now, because it's, we say it's intractable, uh, then we approximate it. And like I just explained to you, it's not a Markov problem anymore. It becomes a very uh, simple static. Okay, we compute one metric and we're able to take action based on that one metric. Yeah, so that's the trick. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much. Um, so yeah, just I think um, maybe to what you just said, isn't it also because you don't have, so if you take an action, it's like deterministic and that's why it's not like in this traditional framework where you're gonna have like Q learning and try to learn the transition probabilities from the states because you basically know, like I can make the call and it's just gonna, like the state is changing this way? No, uh, so uh, it's not deterministic. The state changes in some cases, right? So I make a call and I know the number of call increased by one. Uh, what I don't know is how the debtor will respond. I make a call, does the debtor pick up the phone? Or does the debtor, uh, agree that he or she will repay the debt, uh, or maybe the debt just makes the repayment uh, at that time. So these are things that are uh, not deterministic. If they were deterministic, we can actually then make the, the forward-looking part, right? And because they're not, we can't really model it because then we'd have to make all these different kinds of uh, intermediate predictions. You can throw the mic, actually. <laughs> it's too gentle. Uh, yes, uh, I wanted to ask about the, the definition of value in this case. Yes. I'm just wondering why you didn't, for example, multiply the probability by the overall outstanding debt. If yeah. you want to maximize the total revenue. Uh, you could do that. Uh, we chose not to do that uh, partly because it's a bit easier to understand for the collectors or at least the collection agency, right? Where it's just a change in probability to pay, uh, but you could just, just as easy to say, okay, it's a change in expected repayment. I think they're both uh, more or less the same. And um, you can make arguments either way. Uh, so in this case, the collection agency uh, gets a fixed amount of money per uh, case collected. Uh, so if they wanted to optimize on, um, on their own revenue, then of course uh, they should only care about the number of cases collected and not the, uh, the amount outstanding. Uh, alternatively, if they wanted to collect as much money as possible for their client, uh, then they can uh, multiply that uh, probability by a certain amount for expectation. So in both cases it, it works, it doesn't really matter, it's just one extra step to the process. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, um, my question is uh, about the reduced number of phone calls again, and uh, could you speak up just a bit? Yeah. So the uh, the number of phone calls, why they are going down? Uh, yeah. So is it? Is, uh, do you also consider the cost of calling? Uh, so is there maybe like a break-off point where the cost of calling may be higher than the expected revenue? Um, we don't consider that because we that would be a bit more difficult for the collection agency to implement because they simply decide on their capacity and then they can call as many as they want. Eventually, maybe they can decrease the capacity because they realize that, okay, I don't have that many phone calls that are valuable. However, what you mentioned by the number of phone calls going down, in this graph, it has nothing to do with that. It's just that, oh, look, if people repay their debt after 10 days, you're not going to call them again afterwards, right? Yeah. And that's why by construction, the number of phone calls will decrease as the day since arrival increases. Do you actually also see the length of the phone call? So maybe the difficult no. cases are actually longer, so the number of calls... No, we don't see that. So uh, uh, one extension to this project that we wanted to do um, was to get the, uh, the text logs of the uh, conversations, right? Uh, and then you can make the model. I mean, here I have like 65% uh, AUZ. Uh, I can imagine there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, however, that's uh, private information, and there's a lot of uh, hoops to go through in order to get it. So we haven't reached that stage yet, and we never, uh, may never will. So, Thank you. Yeah. How large is the data set again? Uh, 80,000 uh, cases in the training set. Okay, so uh, second question. Do you foresee this kind of approach can be extended to learn policy, like a series of steps? Uh, can you speak because up Because in this case, you are predicting whether it makes sense to make phone call the yeah. next day. Yeah. Do you see that it's possible to extend this to learn, is to learn a sequence of action? Yes, so, uh, it is. So in this case, we uh, focus on phone calls for one major reason, and that's for simplicity. Because we're in the business of writing academic papers, uh, it's important to have things that are easily understandable. Uh, of course, we could also optimize uh, the timing of the emails with the letters. However, there it's cheap, right? So they don't really have uh, that much to optimize. And also, back to what, uh, uh, what Pavel was saying, um, with the letters and the emails, uh, the, the days which are sent is very consistent. They're usually sent you know, this many days after arrival. So there's not any variation there. But with the phone calls, there's a lot more due to many different reasons. Uh, if you were to think of this in a different problem, like uh, if you are a, uh, an e-commerce company like Amazon, you wanted to send people uh, promotion emails and say, oh, we're, we're discounts, right? Uh, then you can imagine taking this uh, and allowing for many more different types of actions. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So, Jinjin, thank you very much for, uh, for the outstanding uh, presentation. Give an applause to our <laughs> yeah, So. Thanks for uh, attending, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask me or uh, contact me. Uh, I'm very uh, open to discussions. Let's have